so we already understood the basics of cardiac electrophysiology last time uh, especially it's very helpful in understanding the mechanism of the arrhythmia in fact so similarly we will try to see about the conduction time so conduction times or these uh, the basic ep study is done a lot of times whenever there is a patient who comes with the complaints of syncope otherwise loss of consciousness so yes uh, a tilt table test might be done and all, trying to see for the other causes, the neurological causes. However, in cardiology, we tend to neglect uh, a lot of these protocols. So that is why uh, you should try to also see for arrhythmia induction as well. So even a tachycardia, like a ventricular tachycardia could be the cause for the loss of consciousness as well. So that's why, uh, yes, you should try to rule it out as well. And even... Um, VT induction. So, for example, whenever we are trying to test, if the protocol itself is too aggressive, okay, and then you will be able to um, induce a VT, but it doesn't mean that it will be VT inducibility will be seen, okay. So, for that, again, uh, you can say it is positive only when, so for example, if you are able to see at least 10 beats of VT, okay, after the stimulation. Similarly, it will be called negative when it's not inducible at all. If it is less than 10 beats, you will be calling it as short episodes. However, always remember in that as well, in the sense, don't try be, to be excess aggressive as well. So, for example, I mean is if you are using like 5 extras, 6 extras, yes, you will be able to induce. But it doesn't mean that, okay? So, now coming to the uh, you know, the possible components of the EP study. So we already said it, C for the basic intervals, sinus node functions, AV node, his Purkinje, ventricular conduction, refractoriness, you have already defined. Similarly, you were able to see, you know, are there any dual AV node pathways or if there's any accessory pathways as well, you were able to define its presence, where is it located, how about its electrical properties as well. Similarly, are you able to induce any supraventricular or ventricular tachycardia as well. If you are in, able to induce, what is the mechanism for that? And the possible site of origin for the induced arrhythmias as well, you should be able to tell. And how do they respond, for example, to any anti-tachycardia pacing, otherwise any uh, drugs as well? Especially in the early days when EP studies had started, I'm talking like really a few decades earlier, so during that time, it was mostly also for trying to see the response of the drug as well. So that was very important because the ablation therapies had not developed much during those times. So that's why they always used to see how are they responding to these medications. So uh, EP is also another specialty of uh, cardiology in which like other fields, there are associated complications even in this as well. Similarly, so even in this field as well, as I said, it, it is associated with some complications, yes. Mortality is pretty rare because this is one of the uh, very, EP is mostly done by highly skilled professionals. So who all have already done their cardiology training and only after that they further train into EP. So most of the times it is uh, highly skilled hands so that's why yes the uh, the complications are less but yes they do happen okay so like thromboembolism phlebitis cardiac perforations as well and mortality may also happen but it's really rare in fact okay so as the field deals with the arrhythmias and all yes there are a lot of uh, patients who does uh, or may develop even those VF or these other complications as well, you know. So, so now once we are aware of these complications, so now coming to the other tests as well, what are those other tests which we try to do? So for example, one of the simplest tests what we always try to see for is sinus node function test. So we all are aware, so Sinus node is more of an autonomic uh, focus of tissues, okay? And this is the one which has uh, overdrive suppression, okay? So it tends to have a warm-up and also then tends to 
come down to the baseline cycle length in fact. So that is why what you try to do is try to keep on pacing at a higher rate of the sinus rate at least by 30 milliseconds for 30 to 60 seconds and then you abruptly stop. Okay, and then you try to see how much is the time it takes to come to the normal rhythm. So for example, a uh, lot of times there may be various variations. So what is called is, and that is the reason why nowadays it is uh, calculated what is called as corrected sinus SNRT, corrected SNRT. So corrected SNRT is SNRT minus the cycle sin cycle length, okay, which is less than 525 milliseconds in fact, okay. So what do you notice over here is pacing is going on, right? So pacing is, initially pacing is going on and then after like 30 to 60 seconds, 30 seconds, then you just leave it. So for example, how much was the interval which was taken? So for example, over here is the science recovery time is 2060 milliseconds and you see this, uh, the normal sinus cycle length is 900 milliseconds. So you can uh, subtract 900 from this. So it is coming like uh, almost I would say like um, 1100, okay. So 1100 is pretty fine in fact. So if it would be, uh, uh, yeah, now more than 1500 milliseconds, yes, it will be abnormal. As I said it similarly, for the CSNRT, it should be less than 500, okay. So if it will be more than that, so it will be uh, not so right in fact, okay. So I'll tell you a few more things in fact. So this uh, sinoatrial conduction time. So sinoatrial conduction time, so this is more of a single paced electric atrial stimulus which is delivered just before the next spontaneous sinus cycle length. And that's why it will be resetting in fact the sinus node. So what you do is, uh, you will try to do is, uh, so you try to calculate the intervals between the paced stimulus to the next sinus beat and then as it equals the half the difference between the spontaneous cycle length and the return cycle length. Okay, try to re recall this very well and put it up in your long term memory. So, uh, whenever you are thinking about the exit blocks, is this patient having an exit block? That is the time you will try to do is a sinoatrial conduction time. So, similarly, there is a, uh, yeah, CSNRT, we had already said it as well. So, this is as we see in this tracing, so this we are trying to calculate the same in fact, okay. So now the next thing what we all are interested in, how about the atrial ventricular conduction assessment? So if we block, we all are aware of what happens is whenever there are impulses coming from the atrium to the ventricle and there's absence of the physiologic refractiveness, that is when it will happen. So yeah, it can be physiological or even pathological as well. Pathological, we all are aware, a lot of degenerative diseases are there as well. Sometimes some of them are induced even due to food habits, in fact. So, so what are the blocks? So, I think most of us are already aware about the first degree AV block, okay. So, there will be a prolonged PR or long RP intervals. Similarly, the second degree AV block has like type 1 in which there will be progression, uh, you know, the PR is going to be prolonged, prolonged, prolonged and blocked, okay. So that here, the site of block is also very important, which we all should be keeping in mind. Similarly, the type 2 block is the one which is characterized by sudden failure of conduction, okay. There is prolonged conduction manifested with no changes in PI interval, okay. And then comes the finally third degree AV block in which P and R, uh, you know, the atrial and ventricular depolarizations are independent of each other. However, the PP intervals and the RR intervals are fixed, okay. So the other thing, what we all should keep in mind is, what is the possible level of block? Is it suprahus, infrahus, or so these are the tracings which you all will be getting over here. 
So we all are very much aware for this, okay? So as I was telling you how to indicate the block, so as I was as I already tried to say it as well, AV block can proximal. So the proximal AV block is above the his bundle. Okay? So what it means is uh, there is block in the AV node or and it can be intrahesian in fact, okay? It can be distal to the his bundle. So that is what is called as the infrahesian in fact. And yes, uh, whenever we being clinicians, we are interested how about the prognosis. So prognosis will always depend upon the size of the AV block. So for example, if there is a block which is distal to the his bundle, yes, it does imply poor prognosis and definitely it will demand uh, pacing in fact. And that is the reason why uh, the EP study will be able to identify if there is really any need or importance for pacemaker implantation, for example, for someone who is having a syncope or such kind of problems. So yes, try to do a basic conduction interval. So in the sense, if the HV is more than 70 milliseconds, okay, and the person is symptomatic, okay, uh, then that is the time you should be uh, considering as well for such patients, you know, for the pacing. So that is what what we are seeing over here. AH, you can come measure it over here, okay, over here, A AH. However, when you will be looking at the HV interval, is 144 milliseconds. So definitely, this is a, this is an indication for pacing, in fact. So more than 100 is always a, Pacing indication. However, if it is more than 70 uh, to uh, 70 or 78 or 80 as well, but less than 100, so that is the time you will start seeing for if someone is having a degenerative muscular disease. So for those patients, again, you should pace them. So, other than these things, we also have to try to see that how do they respond to the incremental atrial pacing as well. So, for example, uh, so what happens is a lot of times there may be uh, uh, you are trying you will be looking at the level of the AV nodal conduction by looking at the AH interval. Similarly, even in the HV interval is going to be changing as well. So, for example, let's try to see. So, if you will be seeing over here, there is the A stimulus, A stimulus. Okay, this is the A, his, and the V. So what is happening is over here is, okay, the AH interval will be prolonging, so you will have to see for the response as well. Do they, uh, are they prolonging in a good way, are they prolonging or uh, getting, getting short as well, incremental pacing. So those are the various responses which we all have to be careful about. So the, as I was already telling, the AV nodal function, what is going to happen is, the there will be a time, one is to one, AV nodal conduction is going to stop and the Wenke barrett is going to happen. Similarly, so as I was already telling that the AH interval is the one which keeps getting prolonged, 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 prolonged and blocking the AV node. Yeah. And then the normal Wenke back AV block happens around cycle length of 500 to 350 milliseconds in fact. So that is at the heart rate of 120 to 170 minutes per minute. So, so we can see it pretty clear over here. We are pacing, 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 pacing. And finally, the Wenke back happens over here. So, what are the various abnormal response? Abnormal response is Wenke back AV block, which tends to happen at a very slow pacing rate. Okay, so for example, if there is a patient with an enhanced vagal tone or even under the drug effects and at shorter cycle lengths as well in patients with enhanced sympathetic tone as during the exercise. In fact, in contrast to the AH interval, the HV interval remains relatively constant during incremental atrial pacing and block below the his. Okay. 
and is considered pathological at pacing cycle lengths greater than 400 milliseconds. Yeah. So if we look carefully over here, A H V. So H V gets prolonged and then finally comes the block over here. So this is what is infra his block. Yes. So regarding the indications for permanent pacing, so we I as I already said it, if HV is more than 70, yes. More than 100, 200 percent. Similarly, and yes, the patient has to be symptomatic as well. However, if it is more than 100, definitely it's a 100 percent indication. And uh, so when you did this, uh, try to measure those all those intervals and all, and there's a block below the his bundle at atrial pacing rate of less than 150 uh, beats per minute. And it is going to indicate disease in the his Purkinje system, okay, and of course, there will be higher chances for complete heart block, and that is the reason you should try to pace them for sure. So, 